Hey folks, good morning. Um, about a minute before 11, so come on up, Bridget. Get this. Oh, you don't want to be in the shot? You don't want to be in the shot? You want to, you want to say hi to everybody? Come on, come here. Okay, so Bridger's going to, uh, there it is. There we go. So uh, we've got Bridger joining me. He will uh, probably have a lot to add to the session today. Super excited to be joining you today. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. And welcome to this week's Canine Linguistics. Uh, in today's session, we're going to be talking about traveling with your pet. In our case, of course, when we talk about traveling with your pet, we're primarily talking about dogs. Um, I don't propose to know uh, the needs of cats and carriers and other kinds of animals, but um, uh, there are certain things about traveling with your dog that will relate to other things. So if you are not a dog owner but have another pet, hopefully these things will be helpful, be helpful for you too. I had a really exciting morning today. I was thrilled to um, talk to Jeanette Foray and her husband Matt over at 4E Kennels badass breeders. They're a great doodle breeder out of Pahrump, Nevada, and they have a weekly show that they do uh, Fridays with the four E's that they do on um, Friday mornings at eight. And today I had the great opportunity to speak with them about what it means to pick a facility. How do you pick uh, the right kind of facility for your dog? The difference between a doggy daycare and a doggy day school um, you know, a structured enrichment environment for your dog versus just a place where your dog kind of runs around like a lunatic all day. Um, not that running around isn't part of the, the day school environment as well. So uh, as I did some traveling yesterday with my dog um, and had to do some things, preparatory things for that trip, um, I thought that it might be a good idea to share some tips with you guys about that, how to prepare for the trip, things that you need to know about traveling with your pet, what to do when you get to your destination, what to do if something happens at your destination, and, um, and just kind of things, things to know. So that's what we'll be covering today. If you have questions, as always, you can just throw them into the, into the chat. I'll be following them here and we'll be able to ask, and I hate that I just touched my face. Uh, you know, it's like part of me wants to wear a mask when I do this just so that I don't do that, but um, since I'm just here, with the bee man today, don't need to do that. So let's get started. So um, there's a bunch of different ways to travel. You know, fewer people are traveling by by air right now. I'm gonna start with what it takes to prepare to travel uh, when you're traveling by plane. We'll talk a little bit about traveling by car as well, uh, or RV if that's your jam. A lot more people are doing that these days. Um, RV sales are going through the roof. A lot of people are taking to the road um, with that kind of travel. You know, people feeling a bit safer about that kind of travel these days. Um, so, you know, controlling their environment. So there's that kind of travel to be aware of as well. So let's start with traveling with a plane. So what are the things that you need to know regardless of the mode of transportation that you're taking? There are things that you need to think about when you're traveling with your dog. I guess Bridger's done. Um, he's heard this all before. So the first thing to think about is what kinds of illnesses or um, pests or uh, parasites might exist in the place to which you're going or if going by car, the places through which you are going on your way to your destination. This is really important because there are illnesses that are uh, very prevalent in certain parts of the country that are not prevalent in others. So if you live in one area where leptospirosis, for example, is not really a thing, um, where it's very, very rare and dogs tend to not be vaccinated for it, and you're going to a place where leptospirosis is a thing, you run the risk of exposing your dog to something for which it has no protection. So that's one of the first things that you want to think about when you're planning a destination is, does this place to which you're going have fleas? So if you're someone who lives in a place like Phoenix or Las Vegas, fleas aren't really a thing, especially not in most times of year. It's either too hot or too cold. There are times of year when fleas can be a problem, especially if they're imported. 
to, uh, to our area in the more temperate times when, when the weather's in the 70s, flea eggs can live in that temperature. Um, if a dog is coming to a facility, you know, going from air conditioned car right to a facility and it has flea eggs on it, that could be a problem for the facility for sure. So making sure that you're aware. So for example, my dogs travel. So my dogs are on a monthly preventive. That monthly preventive takes care of almost all stages of fleas, as well as a number of kind of regularly occurring intestinal parasites. It's a pill I give them once a month. Now my dogs are considered high risk because they travel a lot. They're exposed to an unusually high number of other dogs. So I take a more comprehensive view of their preventive care than an average dog owner might. But thinking about that traveling, you know, if you're just going somewhere where there are fleas, for example, um, a topical flea solution is something that you could apply to your dog, say the day or so before you leave to give your dogs about 30 days of coverage for while you are traveling. Ticks are another thing. So it's interesting, the monthly preventive I have my dogs on does take care of ticks, which is a good thing because the last time Bridger and I were here in the Bay Area, two ticks. We were in the Presidio and he came out with two ticks, neither of which could attach to him because he had the treatment on board already. I did go ahead and do a, um, a, a flea preventive and tick preventive spray on him, which is completely homeopathic. It is uh, clove oil, cinnamon oil, a number of other naturally occurring essential oils that um, I just sprayed on his coat and then kind of combed through his coat just to give him a little additional support while we were in an area where those could be a problem. So that's one thing to think about. Um, for some vaccines, we can go to leptospirosis again as an example. Leptospirosis, that vaccine is a two-stage vaccine. What that means is for initial immunization, your dog needs one shot and then two to three weeks later, your dog gets a booster. It's a, after that second booster where your dog is considered fully immunized against the illness. So you need about 30 days prior to your trip in the case of a leptospirosis vaccine to make sure that your dog is actually protected, immunized against that illness beforehand. So that's really important to think about. So do some research about the location to which you're going. Things like canine influenza, there are two strains of canine influenza. Not all states have both but there is a bivalent, it's called a bivalent vaccine. It's a vaccine that covers both strains. Um, so leptospirosis, distemper, parvo, typically the vaccines that almost all dogs will have as a regular thing would be rabies, which is required by law pretty much everywhere. Distemper, parvo, bordetella. Those four are the, the main four that you will see that your dog gets as part of its annual wellness check and vaccine update. Canine influenza is a thing. It is now in, I believe, every state in the United States, all of the lower 48 for sure. I'm not sure if they have it in Hawaii. I know they have it in Alaska. So um, it's a pretty serious thing. It can be fatal. One of the strains can be fatal. Highly, highly communicable, highly contagious. So getting your dog vaccinated for that if you're traveling is very, very important. And then of course, as I mentioned, leptospirosis. You're also gonna to wanna, to, I would suggest getting your dog a good comprehensive fecal test before you travel. I'm a huge fan of regular comprehensive fecal exams. Dogs can pick things up. A lot of those things can be communicable to humans. Most of them are highly contagious. Um, and so it's important to think about that because if when you are traveling, you are intending on using a facility to either for daycare services or to overnight board your dog while you're traveling, most facilities are going to require them anyway. So getting one done right before you travel anywhere also then gives you a baseline. Why is a baseline important? We don't know when a dog is sick if we also don't know what the dog is like when it's well. I'm a huge fan of regular vet checks with my veterinarian so that my vet is very familiar with my dogs healthy, very familiar with how they are when they behave normally so that they are able to also note difference in coat, difference in skin, lumps that are there or not there, things, bumps that have changed size or shape. So these are all super important things. 
I travel with a full folder of all of my dogs. I mean, it's a digital folder, but I have a copy of all of my dogs' current vaccination records, as well as a current fecal test report. Now, if you're traveling on a plane, you're also going to need a health certificate. This is a certificate for domesticated travel. Your dog will have to go uh, to the vet a week or less prior to getting on the plane and the certificate is valid for 30 days and 30 days only. So if you're going somewhere for longer than 30 days and then getting on a plane to come back, you'll need to find a vet at your destination. And we'll talk about that in a minute to make sure that you get an updated certificate for the way home. So this certificate, it's a, it's a two, two pieces of paper. It's you know the top half, which can go to the airline, the bottom half, which is a copy for you. And it is a certificate that deems that your dog has been seen by a veterinarian. The veterinarian has conducted a full wellness check and the dog is deemed to be healthy and fit for travel with all of its necessary vaccines up to date. And that certificate, along with a rabies certificate, is what most airlines look for. I typically have with me, in addition to the rabies certificate, as well as this certificate of travel, I usually ask my vet to print out something that is very, very handy. It is called a reminder report. It is a one page printout that your vet should be able to give you that shows all of the vaccines that have been administered on your dog, when they were administered, and when they are next due. It's a great thing to keep handy, put it on your fridge, highlight when the dates are for updates. It's a great way to keep yourself on track and enter those dates into your calendar with a little reminder so that you can be aware of when your dog's vaccines are due. If you're going to be traveling over a period of time and vaccines are coming due, sometimes it might be too soon for that booster to be given, so you might need to get it done while you're away. And so this brings me to my next point. When you travel, making sure you know where the local veterinarian is that's closest to where you're going to be, know where the emergency hospital is in case there is any kind of emergency whatsoever. In case of an emergency, the last thing that you wanna waste your time doing is trying to figure out where to take your dog. And I can give you a personal example from my own life. I was visiting Sonoma, California. This was probably about 18 years ago. And I was on a holiday. I was there for two weeks. I had rented a little house. I had driven up there with my dog, Truman. And um, uh, one afternoon, I just rented a bike and just was riding around town, letting Truman sleep. And I rode past what, you know, was this cute little, it looked like a little gingerbread house, Victorian. And out in front, front was a big sign, Sonoma Animal Clinic. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Look at that cute little veterinary clinic. Mental note. So the next day, I went for a hike with Truman and we were hiking through the Sonoma, all around the Sonoma Creek. And I found this adorable little place with a little pool of water. And I was just sitting on the bank of the creek and eating a picnic lunch and throwing the ball for Truman. And he's running in and out of the water. And I see him kind of come up short and hold his paw, but he grabs the ball and he comes trotting back to me, but I can see that he's limping and he comes out of the water and I pick up his paw and blood just gushes out of his paw. So I immediately grab my water bottle and irrigate it as best I can. And I can see that in the big pad of one of his front feet is a deep gash that's probably about a half inch in length. And I can't see how deep it is, but it's looking like it's at least a half an inch deep as well. A clean slice. I'm guessing that it was probably a piece of glass or something in the creek. So I irrigate his paw. I wrap it up in a, in a, a, a towel really, really tightly. I pick him up. I carry him to the car. And I knew exactly where to go because I had driven by the clinic the day before. Um, this was my lesson that now whenever I travel, I make sure that I go online beforehand. Um, if I have friends who live in the destination where I'm going that have pets, I ask them what veterinary clinics they use. I ask them for referrals for emergency clinics. If I'm staying in a hotel that's dog friendly, I call and I ask the concierge for recommendations and referrals. I call that veterinary clinic. I make sure I make a connection with them before I get to town. I have digital copies of all of my files handy. I let my own veterinarian know where I'm going and veterinary clinics that they might hear from because if they get a call from a clinic out of town and they know that it's an emergency, but I've let them know 
that I'm going to be going out of town, it gives them the ability to respond a little bit more quickly because I've given them the heads up to do so. So first and foremost, making sure your dog is protected, making sure your dog has all the vaccinations they need, that you have all of the protective care for them that you need. You've got an ample supply of their medication if you're traveling with them. You have veterinary resources at the destination to which you're going, so you have somebody to take them to in case of trouble. So that's all of the just in case of emergency being prepared for their health. So now let's talk about their food. It's not a great idea to just change your dog's diet overnight. When we have dogs that stay with us, um, you know, I typically don't recommend that people just change the dog's food so the dog always comes with an ample supply of food for its stay. And so when you travel, make sure you have an ample supply of your dog's food, especially if your dog, like little Bridger over here, has any uh, food allergies or food sensitivities. You want to make sure that you have the food that your dog is comfortable with. You also want to make sure that you know in the destination to which you're headed where to buy the food in case something goes wrong. So a couple of years ago, Bridger and I went to New York and we were staying at a friend's place and part of the deal was I was staying in their place, but I was taking care of their dogs while they were away, which was great. So I had my bag and I had my bag on the floor. It was on me that I still had Bridger's food in the bag. And one of the dogs decided that it was really excited about the little Ziploc bag filled with Bridger's primal pet nuggets and ate them, all of them. I think he might have left one. So I needed to find the food for Bridger. And so I already had gone online. I knew the two stores in town that carried it. Um, I gave a call to the stores just to confirm that they specifically had the flavor that I was looking to get. And Bridger and I hopped on the subway and we headed to the store and we picked it up and then we made our way back. So I, it was very easy for me to do because I knew where to go to get it. Again, if you need something last minute, trying to look for it when you need it, it just creates aggravation. So why not remove the aggravation, go online, have that information before you go. Now, a lot of people might say, look, Kathy, you've got a smartphone, you've got your laptop, all you have to do is go online and search. Of course, but how much easier is it for you to do the search before you go, identify the places, make note of them, maybe put a file on your phone, a document on your phone that has all the information you need so that all you need to do is just look there. It saves a little bit of time. In the case of veterinary care, that extra few minutes that you need could be pretty critical. If your dog gets stung by a bee or stung by a scorpion, if you're in the desert, uh, or bitten by a rattlesnake, if you're out in the desert, or your dog breaks a bone, you're hiking in Colorado and your dog breaks a bone. I um, you know, there's all sorts of cases where making sure that you save time and you have the information that you need at the ready, super important. So I mentioned hotels. One of the things that surprises me fairly frequently are the calls that we get at the Hydrant Club from people who are coming to Las Vegas, they're coming on holiday, they're coming with their dog, and it's not until the day that they're arriving in Vegas that they find out that the hotel where they're staying is not dog friendly. So here's a recommendation. When you call to book your trip, ask if the place where you're staying is dog friendly. Because if it isn't, the time to find a boarding facility is not the day that you arrive in town um, or even the day before you arrive in town. Most dog facilities are going to require some sort of pre-screening before your dog's even allowed to enter their front door. In the case of the Hydrant Club, if you don't have all of the medical records that we need, your dog's not even able to enter our front door for its interview um, and we may be booked. And in today's day and age, especially with traveling, depending on where someone is traveling from and the means that they're using, they are using to travel, we may or may not even be allowed, even able to let them in the facility. So for example, if I have somebody driving in from Arizona, it's gonna be two weeks before I'm comfortable letting those humans enter my facility for the screening and the dog with its belongings enter my facility for the screening because of the COVID rates in that state. So thinking about that in today's day and age, now if somebody flew to me from somewhere and was screened before they got on the plane, temperature check and all of that, 
if they happen to have their own personal COVID test, so that I know that they are negative, you know, we might be able to, to accommodate. But mo for most, for the most part, we're not accommodating any out of town guests right now, um, just because of the potential risk. So thinking about your advanced planning for where you are staying to make sure that the place you are staying is actually legitimately dog friendly and making sure that you're aware of any parameters that they have. So most hotels won't permit you to leave the dog alone in your hotel room unless the dog is in a crate. Pretty simple. So if you don't have a dog that you want to put in a crate for when you go out or you don't want to leave the dog in a hotel room for a lot of hours if you're going out to do stuff, you might want to think about that because you'll definitely need a daycare or a boarding facility in town uh, where you're going in those cases. So think about that as well. So we've talked about vaccinations and records and preparing, bringing medication and bringing food, so bringing all the supplies and things you need for your dog. Um, along with that would be any toys or some good chews that you can use to keep your dog busy um, in the car or while you go out to dinner or what have you, so that's all important to think about as well. Having your preparatory medical services or day or boarding facility services all that information in hand, also important. And of course, making sure that your dog is actually prepared. Uh, your dog, your dog, your, hold that thought. Making sure your hotel is dog friendly. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, so now what else is important? So let's talk about driving by car for a bit. So if I'm traveling by car with my dog, there's a couple things that I need to think about. Uh, I need to think about rest stops, not just for myself and putting gas in the car, but also for letting my dog out to stretch its legs and to go to the bathroom, also important. Um, for a lot of dogs, consuming food or a lot of water immediately before getting in a car or on a plane, not such a great idea, could upset the dog's tummy. Uh, I'm a big advocate, especially for flight, that you take away the dog's food or feed the dog several hours before the dog gets on a plane, making sure the dog has had a chance to fully digest its meal, to go to the bathroom, and to have its system completely cleared out. You're gonna to want to, much as you would do with a puppy before, you know, for housebreaking when it's a puppy, take away water about an hour before the trip begins, um, and then take the dog to go to the bathroom, like right before you get on the plane. Um, you know, planes, we know that being on a plane is a very drying out sort of thing. So when I do a long flight with Bridger, I do have a little collapsible bowl that I'll have with me and I'll give him a little bit of water mid-flight. But what I don't want to do is give him a big bowl of water so that he then has to go to the bathroom while we are still on the plane. Um, for a short flight that's just an hour or so, it's not that big a deal. Your dog and even you can go for a period of time without having to consume water all the time. Um, you know, so getting your dog hydrated and as soon as you get off the plane is a really good idea. If you are traveling through airports with your dogs, it's really important, especially if, if you have connecting flights, check online to see if the airport has a dog relief area. What's really nice is that most of the major airports today have them and they have, some of them only have them in one terminal. A lot of them have them in multiple terminals, but here's some things to think about. We don't really know how often they're cleaned or how well they're cleaned. So I, just like using any other public bathroom, am super, super conscientious about how I use it. Um, you know, in today's day and age, I make sure I'm wearing my mask, I put my gloves on, um, I bring my dog in, um, I you know, have my dog go to the bathroom. Typically they'll have fake grass, they'll have you know, like a little fake fire hydrant. The really, ni the really nice ones are actually really nice. They're tiled, they've got sinks, they've got poop bags, they've got disinfectant. And what I'll do when I go out of that space is I keep baby wipes with me and cleaning wipes. Um, I actually use a, an antimicrobial wipe by a company called Nuti, N-O-O-T-I-E. And I'll just pull out an antimicrobial wipe, I'll wipe my dog's paws off, I'll like just wipe, wipe, wipe his face down. Um, just to make sure that any kind of cooties get left behind. I make sure that I wash my hands thoroughly. As we all know, we need to wash our hands, keep our hands away from our face, which I haven't been doing very well in this conversation this morning, so don't judge. 
So checking though, uh, and I've done this multiple times where I know that I have a layover and I, you know, I've got some time to spare. So I'll make sure that I identify where in the airport that, uh, that, that, uh, relief area is and when I get off the plane I go directly there let him uh, let Bridger you know use the facilities and then go on my way I also always travel with a small roll of poop bags um, much like look when you when you travel say with an infant or a small child you've got your bag of stuff that you travel with you might have wipes if it's a baby you have diapers you'll have you know small ziploc bags of snacks you'll have you know, food that they need, you'll have their medication, you'll have the stuff that they need kind of ready to go. Traveling with a pet is the same thing. You need to make sure you have their leash, you need to make sure that they have their collar on, we'll talk about identification in a second. You need to make sure that you have cleaning supplies and you know, food and water and all the medication and all of those things. So these are all important things to think about. You know, it's, you know, we can just kind of pick up and go. And there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, I can just pick up and go. But depending on the dog that you have, there may be needs that they have. There may be um, materials that you need to get for them or supplies. And so it's really important to think about that so you're not caught, you know, back on your heels without the resources that you need if your dog should need them. So let's talk about also keeping your dog safe. So we often talk about collars and so, um, oh, he's sleeping, I don't disturb him. So on my dog's collars are a couple of things. First, there's the regular old ID tag that has the phone number on it. Then of course, there is the city license tag, uh, which has the identification number with the city, uh, which also logs my dog with the city. I of course have their updated rabies tag, you know, on the collar as well. I also have all of my dogs microchipped. That microchip is kept up to date. I do that on a, I update it usually quarterly when I've got all of my updated vaccines and things done. So I've got, um, you know, all of their health records are updated. A photo is updated to the chip. And that what I usually do is I'll have a photo uploaded to the chip of the dog with me. Because if my dog has a tag or a collar that has my dog's name on it and somebody takes my dog, the person who takes my dog may know my dog's name and may have my dog's other information. But if that chip gets scanned and the photo that comes up isn't the person who's with the dog, whoever scans that chip is going to know that that's not necessarily the owner. So the chip becomes a really valuable way for identifying, you know, the actual owner of a dog, you know, and this is just an actual, a great actual tip. If you ever find a dog, um, making sure that whomever comes to get the dog provides you with a photo of them with the dog. Cause anyone can go online today and get pictures of dogs. Anybody can do it especially if they're able to identify who the owner was or they know the owner and go to someone's Facebook page. There are pictures of me with my dogs, pictures of my dogs everywhere. A picture of me with my dogs though, I don't actually have too many of those online. Um, and even if I did, um, you know, it would be harder for somebody to, I mean, it would really take a lot for somebody to start Photoshopping photos. They'd have to really want to steal that dog. So what else can I tell you? So we already talked about medication, and vaccination and how to keep your dog prepared. So that's super important. Uh, I don't see any questions, so I'm just gonna kind of keep yammer along here. Uh, we talked about veterinarians. We talked about making sure that you have uh, contact information to keep your dog healthy that way. We talked about making sure you contact your destination to make sure that where you're going actually will allow your dog to be with you. And if not, Make sure that you identify some sort of resource or location that you'd be able to utilize while you were in town. Also very important. And another thing, just so that you can enjoy your trip with your dog, look up good if you're going somewhere like, I have a bunch of hikes planned uh, in between the work that I'm doing this week and I made sure to look up good trails, look up trails that are dog friendly. Does my dog need to be on a leash? 
Where are the restaurants that I can go to? I mean, today, day and age, you know, it's patio seating only in most places anyway, but where can I go that might be dog friendly on the patio to take my dog? You know, what are some good stores to check out? What are the best dog parks? When we travel with our dogs, we do it because our dogs are part of our life. And the most glorious part of that, what we get to be is a responsible steward of their existence in the world. We're there to help them have fun and to keep them protected and safe. And traveling with your dog or dogs, I'm a huge advocate of that. I'm a big, big fan. I do it all the time. Uh, and I hope that you got some good tips today on how to do that safely. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for tuning in to this week's Canine Linguistics. Hope you all have a good and safe time out there and uh, 